My name is Jeffrey Cam, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Cam on Twitter or at JeffreyCan.com. My name is Jeffrey Ken, and uh, welcome to another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. Today, I'm joined by Alistair Caithness, who is an executive with a um, oil and gas uh, concern based in Wyoming. If I've got that right, is that correct, Alistair? It, yeah, the company's formed in Wyoming. But okay. I, I'm down in sunny San Diego today. And uh, Zion Inc. And uh, its uh, most interesting angle is the uh, development of new innovative technologies associated with uh, the uh, tracking and tracing of um, uh, oil through supply chain and uh, and in the creation of a uh, a new uh, digital way to track uh, value trade uh, oil and uh, through a, 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 a cryptocurrency uh, type uh, coin. And I wanted to actually talk through how that actually works today with Alistair so that uh, we can get a, a sense as to how this works. This is not the first announcement in the industry about companies attempting this uh, kind of uh, innovation, but um, uh, as, uh, as uh, these things are, the lo- longer they, these things are out in the marketplace, uh, greater levels of innovation come to bear and they, we get smarter and smarter about how they should work. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So Alistair, maybe you could begin with uh, just a bit of background about yourself and, and the company that you're with. So yeah, so my name is uh, Alistair Caithness. I'm the CEO of Zion Inc. Uh, I'm originally from Scotland, but uh, I've been over in America now for four years. So that's when I set up Zion in uh, 2016. Originally, we were uh, uh, first formed as an information company providing information and oil contracts out in the Middle East with a specific focus on the Iraq marketplace. And this was to provide uh, information to Western companies in order to win more business. Uh, When the oil price had the downturn, it actually created an opportunity for us. So Obviously, when the downturn happened and you're in a business where you do business intelligence and marketing, then these budgets disappear very quickly. Yeah. Yep. So, so OPEX, OPEX side of business gets the first squeeze. So Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's before personnel. So yep. when that actually squeeze came down and the oil price kept going lower and lower, what it did do is it created an opportunity for us to actually pivot the company and acquire our first oil asset itself. So what we looked to do was to become a small operator uh, and we got our first asset out in the Illinois basin. All right. So not in the Middle East, per se, uh, obviously, those those assets are generally under um, national oil company control. But you, so the roots roots were in the Middle East to begin, uh, but then um, uh, uh, first assets in North America. Yeah, it was really the opportunity that actually we got out there, first of all. So it was okay. the, it allowed us to get there. And that's where the pivot came from. And then from there, we've acquired another 17 assets in the, the basin over the last 18 months. All, all in Illinois? Or are you spread out now across? Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's all, it's all in Illinois that right. we've actually focused on. And it's really just that focus on there. Now, initially, we looked at the the way they do production in the Illinois Basin. So if you went back, say, 20, 25 years, you would find the likes of Shell, Exxon, or everyone who made Exxon Mobil, Texaco, etc. They would actually all own the leases, and they were all drilling for oil at uh, 300, 500 feet. Mm. But with the development of offshore drilling you know, all the majors pulled out of these peripheral basins in America, a lot to do with the fact that they can't get economies of scale because it's very fragmented because you've got a lot of farmers who own the land and you've mm. got to have an agreement with every farmer in order yep. to actually access the oil. And then obviously they were able to tap into such huge uh, fields uh, offshore and abroad. So again, that also created the opportunity for us because it's one of these places, how do you start up an oil company and then how do you get to marketplace? And, you know, if you're going to go to any offshore uh, oil drilling, then you're going to need huge uh, capex spent in order to get started. But whereby you do the onshore stuff in North America, it's probably one of the cheapest places you can get involved. Yeah, and there's, there's these many of these conventional deposits, as the uh, as, you know, including the, the shift to shales and other unconventional. These these small uh, conventional deposits do get uh, uh, auctioned off by the super majors as they focus on their their large uh, larger deposits. 
So let's turn a little bit to the business problem that you you, you encountered that you wanted to try to solve um, it associated with these small uh, these small producing wells. So with these small producing wells, mm. all we were looking at, at the, to begin with was, you know, how can we push production costs down? So what we realized is that one of your major costs is once you've actually struck oil and you're producing oil is the power to power the pump jack through electricity. Yep. So our thought process is, and we're still going to push forward with this, is we're going to really use uh, renewable energy infrastructure, wind and solar, to generate the electricity to power the pump jack. So it has like multiple benefits. One, it reduces the CO2 emissions of actually producing oil. Mm. And then also it has a cost advantage whereby even if we're not pulling all the electricity required from the grid to power the pump jack, even if we're doing 50%, we're still producing electricity cheaper than the guy next door. Therefore, we're producing oil cheaper than at, the guy at a next lower door. cost. Yeah, and are, yeah. Those, are those wells are they are they grid accessible, or would your or was your, your design would need to bring a renewable, um, say, put solar panels or a, uh, or a wind turbine, you know, in a, in a collection of wells? How, how, how did that work? Because so, one of the problems is you know we don't have the wires out to many of these uh, these remote infrastructure. Yeah, so so all the wells are already connected to the grid anyway. Oh, okay. So in most of these basins, like the majority right. are, they run diesel generators and some that aren't, mm. but generally they're all connected to the grid. So all you would be doing is bringing in mobile units. So it'll be mobile wind turbine, mobile solar panels, connecting it to the pump jack and generating the electricity there. And as we generate electricity, as long as we have to pull off less than the grid, then therefore the cost advantage starts. Fantastic. So, so a cost focus, and then, but energy is uh, one cost, but there's many other costs associated with these wells. But, but clearly, the business problem was how, how, how do you reduce the costs so that these, um, these um, marginally, marginal producing wells could be cost competitive? So, yeah, it's to do with, yeah, it's, it's also, it's like you can get production down in these basins to like $15 a barrel. You know, mm. the cost of production is very cheap. It's the, it's the quantities of oil. See, the entire Illinois basin only does 33,000 barrels a day, uh, you know. So yeah. that's, and that's covering, you know, in its heyday, it was doing 100,000 barrels or 140,000 barrels, actually. So it's actually gone down a lot. So everything in America, it's all the Permian, whereby the big production is. Yep. So the opportunity is still there in these small basins. And it's crude oil they're traditionally doing there, uh, producing there anyway. You know, some of the uh, smaller operators now moving into fracking just because they're all set up as LLCs and you can get, uh, uh, you know. Preferential stru- yeah, financial structuring for that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. So so we got uh, low volume producing wells, high costs, but you can drive the costs down. Um, and so, again, back to the back to the question, what what is the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, in terms of the business uh, problem you're trying to solve, uh, well, uh, wh- where, where did you take this? So essentially, we were looking to get involved in this transition in energy, you know, transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Now, you know, obviously, it's so it's a hot topic in America right now with the Green Deal, and you've got people like AOC, etc., pushing this hard. Mm. But you can't go from a country that's reliant on oil to suddenly being reliant on renewable energy. So to me, the thought process is, you know, you've got to get involved in this transition. So if we can use renewable energy to generate the electricity to make fossil fuels. Therefore, it starts this transition process, but it also what it does do is it drops the CO2 emissions because no longer are you needing to, your, that electricity is actually created through green energy. Right, yeah. Yeah, and see, so, I, this is one of the, one of the, the um, insights from many observers of the industry is is that we are the transition cannot be overnight and simply shutting the existing world off uh, doesn't work because um the in the wells decline at five percent a year would be be crazy to uh uh, to to uh, halt all the fossil fuel in its tracks because um, one year from now there'd be five percent less energy and <laughs> the, the, the impact on the industry would be uh, all, all of society would be catastrophic. Yeah, plus you know by twenty fifty we're looking to have double the energy requirement for the world yeah, anyway than exactly. what it is. So yeah. you know we, we, there's a curve of right now that we are needing more and more energy, you know, as China, India, these places are taking huge amounts of energy from the rest of the world. You know, a lot, you know, in America, the coal industry, you know, right now they're mining coal to export to China. 
mm. not to actually burn on the, the burn domestically, yeah, the yeah, yeah. domestically any longer, you yeah. Know? And so, where and how does a blockchain fit into into this uh, game? It, it plan? was really, uh, the, it was actually the space that we were in. So we were actually getting regulated under Regulation A and Regulation D. So Zion Inc was the thirty third company in America to be uh, qualified under Regulation A+. So this was the latest regulation by the SEC that allowed non-accredited investors to invest in startups from the ground floor up. And it was really just that space. So as this tokenization part came in, it was all the same people who were involved in regulation are now involved in issuance and tokens. So really, we were in the space of it. As our, you know, our transfer agent, um, VStock, They've got a division now. They're launching V Token. So again, all the people I was following were actually moving into this tokenization and the, uh, essentially the, the birth of the blockchain space through regulations. Mm -hmm. So our company was essentially in this space. I was following the space, you know, and the, the people who I follow online in terms of, uh, you know, to learn more about the company and the regulations, etc. They just start talking about this more and more in terms of security token offerings and taking this tokenization from the crypto world and essentially in a, you know, the simplistic way is the SEC are trying to regulate cryptocurrency or tokenization and allowing your VCs and private venture co uh, companies and investment banks to get into the blockchain space. Mm. So to me, uh, we were in this space anyway because we were getting regulated that way. So I think there was an announcement recently as the first regulation A blockchain company's just been regulated to raise funding from it. So it was really from a fundraising perspective we were in that space and then because we were involved in terms of the the oil and gas perspective i just realized that there was nobody looking at what we were looking to do so then i realized that you know we're sitting on these assets is there any way we could actually start to tokenize it and move into the space from there well, so let's, i just uh, let's just try peel that apart a little bit because the uh, for for those who uh, who are listening along with us today uh, may not have the the depth of understanding of how tokens actually work in in the connection of uh, in connection with a an oil producing asset so maybe maybe in a simplified way perhaps you can just describe what what is the problem or what is the uh, yeah. the solution and how it's how so, it's intended so, to work yeah so we're basically standing on top of the shoulders of the people who went before us so as, as, so when you look at creating an energy cryptocurrency and then a lot of people say you know how's energy cryptocurrency going to be like bitcoin essentially an energy cryptocurrency and the ideas that went before us they were like Libra. It was a stable coin for the oil and gas industry because right now the oil and gas industry, you know, spends approximately two hundred billion dollars a year on transaction fees. Mm -hmm. Now this yep. is cross-border transaction fees, and this is all banking charges. Especially when you start going to places like Iraq, Libya, these other parts of the world, whereby Western banks don't operate, then you know they have to juggle money around to get deals done in these places. Mm -hmm. So that's the way everyone looked at the problem before: is if we can create a stable coin like Libras for the oil industry, then it'll remove the transaction part of it. And then how do you benchmark it? And, you know, whether you benchmark it against a barrel of oil or against kilowatts of uh, electricity or therms of energy, there's all ways in looking at the problem. But it all comes down to the same thing, Jeffrey, is unless you get adoption from the big operators, you know, you and I could create the world's greatest oil and energy cryptocurrency, but if they don't use it, then uh, you know it's it's just not going to work. Yeah, it, adoption is is the big is the big challenge here. In fact, in fact, many of the use cases that you can see emerging in the uh, um, of the broad, other uh, segments of the economy, uh, thinking here about Maersk and uh, the use of blockchain on containers, or Walmart and the use of blockchain to track foodstuffs through the supply chain. There, there typically needs to be a large uh, in, uh, incumbent in the industry. Who pioneers these things to to drive them forward? Um, so uh, adoption is really one of the critical uh, challenge yeah. areas and, for sure. And I think it was, and as we started to move into the space, and you mm. looked at it, it, you just realized that the adoption was the problem. So even if we had an SEC regulated version of a you know a cryptocurrency. To begin with, it would be compliant. Then it would have to obviously get approved to become regulated. 
you would still have the same problem unless you get the super majors using it, then it's not going to get adopted. So then we start to look at it from a different angle. And I think this is what the blockchain is all about. It's to me, the blockchain is providing this opportunity for the entire world to solve problems in a different way than we've had in the past. So then we start to strip back everything. So what can we do? You know, we're obviously in the space, there's problems to be solved. And this is when we start to realize that if we can strip it right back to the beginning and we can actually just tokenize a producing asset on the blockchain, on an Ethereum blockchain, this in itself is going to have so many benefits to the industry that will ripple it all the way across. And this is really tied into the other part, the Zion Energy part of the business. So we're lucky because we're not just a blockchain company who's coming from, right, we've put some ideas together, we're starting from scratch. We've actually been involved in... Uh, the industry for the last three and a half years, okay, on a small scale. Producing so oil, go, actually. Yeah, yeah with producing your own oil. resources. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And then, so you start looking at, so let's go back to the Illinois Basin. What is the problem? So the problem is right now that if you invest in an oil project in the Illinois Basin, if you were going in with an operator, most of the investment money that people are looking for, so the operator, obviously the farmer will maybe take you know, normally it's 12 and a half percent, an eighth of any production. You know, your main operator can take, you know, the rest or 70, 80 percent. And then usually they've got like 50 to 100 to even more small investors who have working interests in this project. Mm -hmm. And you usually invest, whether it's a tax break, but you usually invest in the drilling aspect of the project because that's where the costs come in. And once it moves into production and you start producing oil, then you're dealing with Country Mark, the main um, refining company in the area. Mm -hmm. And then what happens at that point is, you know, every time your storage facilities are full, there's two pipelines that go through the Illinois Basin. So if you're close enough to the pipeline, your oil goes in there. Alternatively, they've got like 45 trucks that run around the basin every day and then they pick up the oil. And depending on how much oil that you sell over a month, then uh, Country Mark basically give you, on average, like $10 less than the oil price because obviously that's the refining charge and picking it up. And then everybody gets their cut their check at the end of the month. The farmer gets cut his check or landowner. The main operator gets cut their check. And then these 100 people who've got small working interests get cut checks. And sometimes they are like $50, $200 a month. And this can go on for 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. But the problem really being is the money's actually locked into this project. So each month uh, you're getting your check and this can go on for, say, 10 years or 15 years. But then how do you unlock the liquidity? So if you actually think about what we're about to do, by us tokenizing the asset and everyone who's got working interests have got tokens, and then we create a secondary trading platform for order people to actually trade these platforms. And now, you know, we're not going to be an alternative trading system. We'll have a, a trading system behind us. But essentially, what we're about to do is create this new level of liquidity into the industry, whereby money's currently locked in these projects, you can't move the money. If we tokenize it, then people have had this opportunity to sell the working interest. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. So if I may, if, let's imagine I'm a small, a small scale investor. I, I have a, sh a working interest in one of these wells. Uh, how do I sell my working interest to another party? Uh, how, how do I give it? How do I? How do I gift it? So, for instance, to a uh, yeah. you know to an inheritance. How do I? If I sell my land. Uh, what happens to the the uh, working interest of the of the that I have in that particular producing well? All these questions get wrapped up in the the accounting uh, back end of of uh, solving for the distribution of proceeds for the, for these operating assets. And what you're I think what I'm you're 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 arguing he, to here is that by creating a an, an abstraction of this uh, at a at a token level, uh, we can unlock the liquidity uh, opportunity to allow people to buy, sell, and trade their interests. Uh, in a level that they can't presently do, given the current way we do things. Yeah, that's that's a hundred percent correct. Yep. So that, that and and when you start to think about that, so when we you just you just basically hit the nail on the head there, Jeffrey. Exactly, that's what's going to happen. But yeah. then you start thinking about the ripple effects of what's coming in. Well, you're creating a new asset class. I mean, this is a, fin fin a financially. Uh, when was the last time a new financial asset class was created? Right, of, of, oh, yeah. of, of scale. I mean, I I was thinking it from a small scale, mm. you know, uh, small uh, projects and doing mm. this in terms of, the, the, you know, the 
uh, non non interest working ops that they're actually yeah. starting to create. But if you start thinking about the process, if this starts going to the bigger operators going into this, so again, this suddenly becomes right. How do we model this? So the very first uh, asset we'll tokenize is Zion Energy asset, and by actually creating a platform, so. You know, you get more people involved in the company who are sort of experts in the oil trading space to come up with ideas on how to develop this. But yeah. if we've got a trading platform to move away from having one energy cryptocurrency and then one token we all trade, if we are we're designing it whereby everyone essentially is about to create their own tokens. So BP, if they came in there, they would do BP in the name of the project and then they would tokenize that project. And then BP can sell the tokens through the platform, or they can alternatively sell the tokens, you know, through their own website, etc. It'll be on the Ethereum blockchain. But but again, it allows adoption because you're no longer trying to force everyone to use Zion Energy tokens. You've got now get everyone using their own tokens. And I think that idea and how it's actually going to operate starts to change, you know, A for the adoption, but also B for a, a sort of use case of the blockchain, whereby if the platform works, and bear in mind there's 300,000 oil leases in America, and obviously they're not all producing asset, but there's thousands of producing assets. If we actually unlock the this capability to access finance, you know, we could have essentially thousands of small producing assets on this platform. And if you look to people doing token issuance right now, where they're just doing one by one case. Mm-hmm. If we can suddenly have like, by the way, if by our platform on the back end of your ATS is creating a thousand token offerings for producing oil assets, suddenly this use case of the blockchain could be one of the biggest ones out there. Yeah, it would be a uh, unlock a tremendous um, uh, uh, value promise, I think. But what's been the industry's reaction so far when you've talked to uh, play, uh, uh, companies in, 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 involved in or uh, either producers or those who have a significant position in the current uh, uh, working interest model? What's been their reaction to the, these I, ideas? I, I, think, I think as we develop the idea, they're liking the idea more and more. I think when we originally looked at the space and we talked about doing an energy cryptocurrency, I think it, when you look at that, because no one's done it before and everyone knows it's about adoption, they, they just didn't think that was a doable project. Whereby, as we've stripped it back and we're looking at creating an energy trading platform now, and you know we're going to have some big announcements coming out in the coming weeks of the partners who are going to help us deliver this uh, project, essentially, it's now going to become you know a reality. Now, again... The great thing about the platform is if we've only put on Zion Energy projects to begin with, the platform works and it can be scaled out to, with a utility token of having one project all the way up to a thousand projects. Mm. And to me, or 10,000 projects or 100,000 projects. Now, obviously, we're going to do it in the US first of all, because that's where we're based and that's where all our attorneys have their, you know, they're all regulated and that's where the knowledge the is. S- yeah, the SEC drives the bus here um, the in, S- in the oil the, industry. Definitely the SEC yep. drives the bus and, uh, you know, tokenization in the US is going to be driven by the SEC and when they really allow the likes of T0 and that's to start to trade. Yeah. Because it's all under regulation and rules. So when you actually invest in Zion coin right now, so Zion coin, in order us to do this, it's actually not a cryptocurrency. What it is, is as a digital token against the assets of Zion Inc. Essentially, it's like a, a it's a, like a fractured share. You know, it's uh, it, the, all the um, shareholders that, they'll be able to have a, a fracture share, which is one hundredth of a share, which is a token or a coin offering. And this is the advantages of being based in a place like Wyoming, whereby cryptocurrency is legal there now. So in Wyoming, if you want to go into a BMW and buy yourself a car, they have to accept Bitcoin, you know? Oh, is, yeah, uh, that's a big that's a big plus. It means that um, you know, there's probably under, another message for um, uh, regulators out there, which are uh, is that the... Uh, the, the speed with which other uh, regulatory environments adapt to these uh, these new new innovations uh, gives the local and business community a leg up in experimenting, trialing, and, and seeing what works and what doesn't work. 
Uh, so early adopters do get a win when the regulator gets on board uh, with, with these it, things. It's massive. And then yeah. the other thing as well, Jeffy, is like we, you know, if you go to our SEC filings, you'll see we filed Zinecoin there as a digital energy token in order to do this. But when we actually run all the way through and, you know, we're going to be minting our first tokens, you know, in the in the next two weeks, we're in the final process, you know, they'll be held in a digital wallet like MetaMask, which is Google's new uh, digital wallet that's free to use. You know, this is why it's going to be so big by the time Google's basically providing wallets for you to download into your browser you know and your zine coin's going to be there next to bitcoin ethereum etc but two things one it's going to be restricted under rule 144 so you know the crypto world are thinking you know what's this restriction but that's because the sec have regulated it this is like this is convergence of two it's like traditional securities and the crypto world starting to converge together that's why the sec are being so tight and everything coming through yeah because once it opens it's going to be massive because to put things in perspective, you know, Bitcoin valuation is around $12,000 today. It went up to $19,000. If they, if, if they basically made one token for the entire oil industry and just for oil itself, you know, you're, you're talking about each Bitcoin being worth $260,000. So it puts things in perspective and that's still only 3% of the world's GDP. And that's, so you think and, of, and that's just with oil. Yeah, that's just yeah, one yeah. kind of commodity. You know, we, so, have, yeah, we still know. have gas so, to so, think about and other minerals and so forth, you know. Oh, yeah, it's, it's like massive. So it's like converging everything together. So yep. what we are doing is right at the forefront. So the amount of legal guys that are coming into the company is just... Uh, I just have meetings with lawyers all day long telling me I can't do things. <laughs> yeah, and you'll have I, I, you'll, I, and don't forget the tax professionals too, because the uh, you know the, one of the questions in all of this, uh, aside from uh, the um, uh, use of the the coin to represent a physical asset, but uh, the valuation of of the asset uh, frequently is a taxable. Um, uh, creates a taxable event from a, a government standpoint or a taxation yeah, authority standpoint. That's one of the big things about the platform. If you, if you tokenize these assets and when you get your monthly check as a working interest in a token and we've got other producing assets you can invest in, you can suddenly reinvest this through tokens and other projects and avoid having to pay tax from the monthly checks coming out. Now, obviously, as you say, there'll be sort of all sorts of tax people involved in doing this. But this is just another problem that it solves by doing this, you know, and it's just this This will have a huge ripple effects again. The other thing what it will do is people want to invest in the oil industry and want to invest in these peripheral basins, but they want to invest on some things a bit more of a dead cert, like a producing asset. Mm -hmm. But you've got to invest in drilling really to get into these smaller projects whereby suddenly with a platform giving you this opportunity, I think it's a new level of investment will come into it. And then from a money lending point of view, you know, I, I've speaking to quite a few experts from Houston who are involved in the blockchain space and oil and gas from a money lending perspective, by unlocking the asset, it's creating a new level of liquidity. And then the money lenders, you know, as much as they need security, what they want to do is lend you money. And if they can lend money against this new level of liquidity, suddenly it creates another layer of finance that's going to come into the oil industry that can essentially, you know, make it even bigger. So aside from uh, so a couple of things uh, benefits that I'm uh, that that really uh, come through here. One is there's a cost um, um, cost out opportunity because the there's a great deal of back end bookkeeping and accounting and so forth that goes on um, with respect to the um, uh, cost and revenue allocations on producing assets. So that is simplified to a degree. Then there is the expansion of the financial uh, marketplace, uh, the creation of a new financial asset. Uh, the the uh, creation of liquidity in the industry that where they're presently that some of those assets are are effectively illiquid as they're trapped uh, with the physical asset. So there, there's a variety of benefits lurking here. Uh, have you have you given any thoughts uh, as to or 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 has has the the size and the potential value release uh, been quantified to this point? If this if if we could transform the industry, it certainly sounds like it's measured in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Yeah, it, it's a $100 billion project, yeah. you know? We, the, the, the platform itself is essentially is going to be launched as a subsidiary of Zine Inc., you know? So yeah. it'll be so the platform itself, so uh, Zine Energy Trade Forum will be the platform. 
the partners will have to go in to make this work. I'll be owning that. You know, I don't, we're not going to own the whole thing because we're bringing in the right partners to push the whole thing through. So to me, that's when announcements come out and the success of everything starting to come together. Another massive benefit right now as well that it's, it's like benefits as you speak to people in the space, you don't think of it yourself. It's just by unlocking this liquidity. But right now, in the US, if you're actually wanting to acquire an oil lease or mineral rights of someone, all this information is held in local courthouses. So you have to go, you've got a landman who has to go to the local courthouse, look at the previous, um, you know, lease, all the records, who actually yeah. owns it, yeah. you know, go through the families, trace it all, find out if they've produced oil there last 12 months. You know, it's a full-time job that's actually happening. And it's a, it's essentially an archaic system whereby some of these uh, documents are held on paper in specific courthouses, whereby if we start to move to a tokenization project and using the blockchain, essentially you'll be able to actually, you know, I say in 10 years from now, the entire oil industry uh, in America in terms of who owns what and uh, the leases and, you know, ownership rights will all be in the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And that again will just make it so much easier to find out information, so much easier to get involved in things. And they'll start sharing seismic data along with this as well. It'll just make it mean it's more likely to cheaper for drilling costs because you know where the oil is, you'll be able to produce it easier, easier to put everything together. There's just like multiple benefits, as you touched on before, mm. from just an administration point of view by moving to the blockchain. What, uh, what lessons have you taken away from the experience of um, moving down this, uh, um, this, this pathway to value? Uh, and just thinking here about at least, at least one comes to mind, which was uh, uh, the the uh, need to adjust course, the pivot, as, uh, as it's called. Um, mm -hmm. And so recognizing when and uh, to do that, I think, is uh, one insight. But what other lessons have you taken from this experience so far? I, I think the lesson is that once people start to discover the blockchain, it's a bit like the, the start of the Internet. You know, if you think about the Internet, the Internet started with email. The blockchain started with Bitcoin. But it's, it's not going to be everything about the blockchain, just the same way as the Internet is not everything about email. You know, we use it every day. You know, we're, we're going to start using the blockchain through smart contracts anyway. So suddenly the whole world's going to be engulfed with this new technology. Now, you know, I keep saying to people, you know, I, I know how the Internet works. Well, write me 50 words and tell me how it works. You know, well, I can't really do that. <laughs> yeah. but I can use it, you know. Yeah, it's like saying to I say, I say this to a lot of people, too. About, you know, do, do you know how a carburetor actually works? Not really, but you do use a car and you're pretty happy with using the car. So, yeah. you know, we, 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 once we get over our, uh, our, uh, uh, our own uh, desire to understand how things work and just set, set them to the side and accept that they actually do work, then yeah, some, um, amazing things can, uh, can move along. Uh, and I, yeah. And I think the blockchain with its capabilities, we're going to unlock so many problems with what we're about to do, you know, and it's just, yeah. and to me, you know, one of the aspects of what we're looking to develop with the blockchain comes back to the idea of using renewable energy in this transition of energy. So what we want to implement once we've actually got these producing assets on there is a form of carbon credit model to incentivize the big operators to speed up this process of reducing carbon with the production of oil. You know? Yeah, yeah. They, 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 once the platform's in place, the the token can then be used to represent um, other other commodity type assets, not just the oil, but yeah, yeah. Uh, and gases the, you know, and carbon and so forth. So yeah, and it, and you know, and it, it, like um, my my brother and all my friends play golf with call me the beekeeper because I always wear this big hat. You know, I mean to avoid the sun, but you know, my granddad <laughs> was a beekeeper as well. You know, and to me, the plight of bees is you know something you want to save. You know, I, I love walking in the countryside. It was brought up in the country, so you know, I might be involved in the oil industry, but I'm more a realist rather. Than one of these people that's just pure optimist. But I feel that if we create a trading platform, which, you know, it will be worth over $100 billion, and what a percentage our company owns of that, it's going to be huge return to our shareholders, which is obviously key. But if we can implement some form of carbon credit model whereby we can actually monetize and speed up the process of the Green Deal that they all seem to talk about, you know, we're providing a solution. It's not just me. There's other people providing solutions. And I think the blockchain, once we get our head around this concept, there's thousands of problems in the world that we're going to be able to solve like nothing before. Yeah. 
any advice you might have to share with uh, other entrepreneurs um, who are looking at problems like this to solve in the industry? Yeah, I think the best thing is just you want to start, you want to delve straight into it, start watching videos, start learning about it, learn what people have done before in the process. You know, it's just, you know, we looked at uh, the company Oilcoin, which was the first one that actually did an ICO in terms of, um, and I know some of the key guys within that company and they're advising us going forward right now, but they were ahead of the curve. And you're talking guys from like Goldman Sachs and Credit Suisse and uh, these guys doing this problem. So they were ahead of the curve and their coin was going to represent a barrel of oil. And even though they had over a billion dollars worth of reserves in the Permian Basin, they still couldn't push it through because of the adoption. And they were probably ahead of the curve. Mm. So, you know, these guys have come in there, always ask for help, always look to collaborate. You know, I've got a good idea. I have to collaborate. I just want to work with the best people out there and just understand what your limitations are. So bring in the best people to help you because they're the ones who've got experience, can push it through, advise you what they've done wrong. And what you find is because people are in this space, They've got a passion to make the project a reality. And then they look at what you're doing in terms of we're coming at it from a different angle, from a very small scale of actually tokenizing an asset. So by us tokenizing these small assets in the Illinois Basin, if we can test the model in the Illinois Basin, then we can roll out to the Wyoming, Oklahoma Basin until it's completely dialed in. Then we're going to launch it at the Permian. And then at that point, if we can get the big operators involved and they like the project because we're basically designing it to help them, especially putting in a carbon credit model, which is huge in terms of the, the big oil companies, you know, especially downstream like Total and Oxy and these guys right now, they're already working models with this. It's, you know, you're, you're creating something to make the big oil companies look green. You're going to unlock liquidity. You're going to make them more money. And, you know, you know, there's they probably just buy us and call us, you know, <laughs> well, it'll move. It'll certainly move the uh, move move the, the the change along that we all are are anxiously yeah. uh, trying yeah. to drive forward the energy transition. Yeah, I, I get a lot of support as well yeah. from some of the key guys in the industry. So one of the the guys that I have spoken to about what we're doing a couple of times, the guy Karn sued from Shell, and you know, if you ever meet Karn, and uh, I don't know if you've met him already, Jeffrey, uh, but. Uh, He's uh, when you meet him, you think he's just like uh, some entrepreneur software guy from Silicon Valley. You don't think this guy works for Shell because you usually think and you go to these vents, these stuffy guys that wear the three piece suits, you know? Yeah. Sad well, as it, as it turns, the majors are investing uh, in, in many of these technologies oh. to understand how they work and what uh, implications they raise. And Shell yeah. is probably one of the leaders in uh, at least definitely. most publicly. Yeah, definitely. And they're all looking at smart contracts. And this is how it will get yeah. rolled to the industry. I know in the industry right now, there's a lot of people think, oh, is it going to get rolled out? But to me, it's going to get rolled out through smart contracts before they know it. And you'll just be using the smart contracts and you're using the blockchain. You know, there's more and more events that are people are speaking about this. They've all got key personnel within it. And all these guys are super smart, you know? Yeah. It's like, and then what we are doing is we are doing something that to them is more high risk. It's tokenizing oil assets. But it's like anything in the oil industry in the subsea industry, you know, if we develop the technology and it works, they either acquire us or start using it, you yeah, know? Yeah, that's it's how the industry works. Uh, Alistair, I'd like to thank you very much for um, uh, coming on to the podcast today and sharing your perspectives with us about these digital innovations, in particular, the uh, potential for tokenization of uh, oil assets. And uh, we'll be watching your um, successes in the years to come. Thank you so much for today. Yeah, thanks so much, Jeffrey. Have a nice day. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil and Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.